we're gathered in his name today. And, and today is the day that we continue in our sermon series entitled Devoted. And we're considering in the, fact, in the light of the fact that God's amazing faithfulness to us, in light of his care for us and love for us, how can we as followers of Christ grow in greater devotion to him? And before we dive into today's sermon, I want to flash back a couple weeks. And a couple weeks ago, we focused on what it means to be devoted to sacrificial giving. If we consider what it means as we give our lives away, if we give of ourselves into God's purposes, how he aligns our hearts with his heart, and he realigns our lives with his purposes. And during that sermon, I shared that I and our leadership would, provo- would be providing you with some tools to help you discern and pray through your financial commitments to two- in 2019 to Restoration Church. And uh, so tonight, this, mor- this morning, I want to invite Dave Stanford and his team who's going to be handing out Uh, specific what that tool is. And you're going to receive in an envelope a letter which includes a a guidance for prayer and discernment. And in this letter, it's going to describe ways that you can engage and pray about your financial commitment to Restoration Church in 2019. Um, And with it also are some specific commitment cards. Um, At the top of the letter, it really summarizes what we're seeking. And it says this, our desire is that in 2019, each family of Restoration Church would make a prayerful commitment to financial giving that they will cheerfully fulfill. We hope that this effort increases your devotion to Jesus and his kingdom so that our church can plant deep and wide more faithfully in 2019. And so with this, our prayer is that when Jesus taught, he said, where your treasure is, your heart will be also. Is that it's up to us and me as your pastor and as shepherd leader, along with our session, as we seek to shepherd you, We want you to grow in your devotion to Christ. And one aspect of that, there's many aspects. One aspect is through how we give financially, specifically to the local church. And just to give you some guidance that's in this letter, for me it's been very helpful and for Laurie and I and our family to go through these five Ps that have been helpful to us. One is to plan. To plan. To try to create a plan to have something to stick to for the year. It's been said many times, if you aim for nothing, you hit it every single time. And, And for us to say... As for our family, what are we planning for? In terms of what God's given to us, what are we giving back to him? Second P is to prioritize, right? To prioritize the giving so that we're not giving from, merely from leftovers, but seeking to say as our income comes in, what are we giving to God first? You know, and then as we consider what do we save next, and then what goes on to the rest of our expenses, but how can we prioritize? The third P is purposeful, to be strategic and intentional, Again, recognizing and praying and believing that as we give away of our financial resources, that Jesus' teaching is true, that where our treasure is, our heart will be also. And as we give more and more of our lives to his kingdom purposes, he aligns our heart with his. The fourth P is percentage. And this has been helpful for many throughout. Uh, I mean, as we think about those who can consider and pray about, pray about what to give to a local church, to consider a percentage. Whether it's a specific, a biblical tithe, which we see in the Old Testament into the new of 10% of, of income. And if 10% seems crazy to say, whoa, can we start with 1%, maybe 3 5%? And that brings to the fifth P, which is progression, to work towards increasing your percentage over time. Um, and so we haven't done this as a church. And as I shared in an email this last couple of weeks, that I feel like I've done a disservice to you as your pastor. And if part of being a disciple of Jesus is pointing your financial resources to his kingdom purposes, meaning that align, then it helps align your heart and your mind with his purposes, part of my role, no doubt, is to help you do that. And our session wants to help you do that. So here's how it works. This week, we ask that you read the letter. There's a set of questions and answers in the letter that could help you pray through and discern your financial commitment for 2019. And in the envelope, you also will find two commitment cards. On these commitment cards, we ask that you... Fill both of them out. They're identical. Put your name. And as you pray this week about either a percentage or a specific amount that you want, feel led to commit to Restoration Church in 2019, to write that number down. To also include with it how how frequently you're going to give. Maybe it's weekly. Maybe it's monthly, quarterly, or yearly. That helps us predict in terms of giving for the church. And lastly, how you give, whether electronically or by check. Um, This information each card will only be seen by our bookkeeper, Amy Gacky. Um, our elders and deacons will know who has turned them in because we want to help you if you have questions about, about these cards. Uh, but, every, but the only person who will see the specifics is our bookkeeper. And so next week, we ask that you bring these cards back and you bring it in the envelope. Save one of the cards for your records. 
Bring the other one back inside the envelope, and there's going to be a time of reflection during the worship service, a time of prayer where you can come forward. There'll be stations, whether up front or on the side, and we ask that you hand in these commitment cards as a way of saying, here's what I'm committing to in 2019 to help so we can fund the mission of Restoration Church, but also give to those who are in need. Um, so that's how we're going to proceed. You'll see that next week. Uh, and I ask, I'll be praying for you as, as you consider this this week of ways that you could set a goal for 2019 so that us together can pool our resources for the maximum impact of the gospel. Sound good? All right. Let's pray for that and pray for the sermon as we jump in. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you that you are the God of all creation. We praise you for being the maker of all things. You are the source. You are the giver of good gifts. God, nothing that we have comes apart from you. So help us, Lord, to grow in our worship of you through how we give of ourselves, including of our financial resources. God, I pray and ask that you would wow us and amaze us and surprise us as we take steps of faith to commit to you. Lord, as we respond to your great faithfulness to us, God, that we would experience your grace in a new and exciting way individually, as families, and as a church family. And so, God, may you be close with us this week as we pray and discern and, and bring this back next week. Now, guys, we can shift towards today's sermon. God, we ask that you would give us your grace and wisdom now. We ask, Lord Jesus, that you would teach us from your word and that you would give us receptive hearts and minds to what you want to teach us. Transform us, change us. May we leave here different because we've experienced you both in your word and through our time of communion together. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So indeed, we are continuing in our sermon series. It's called Devoted. I got really excited thinking about this sermon series coming into 2019 as thinking, how can I and our, our church staff and session help all of us grow closer to God? How can we grow in our devotion to God, recognizing that he is faithful to us? His faithfulness is rock solid. His mercies are new every morning. And so then how can we, in response to his faithfulness, grow in our devotion to him? How can we become more and more devoted to God in our lives? Because there's so many things that pull at us every single day. Am I right? I mean, thing, everything there that pulls, that pulls for our attention, pulls for our affection, and pulls for our devotion. And we have to make decisions. We have to make choices. And the decisions that, make, that we make shape who we are. And so I believe we owe it to God, we owe it to others, and we owe it to ourselves to ask the question, to what are we devoted? And specifically as followers of Christ, how does that make us different than the rest of the world? And so to do that, we've been looking at the book of Acts, chapter 2, 42 through 47, which provides a snapshot of the early church, these dear Christians who, were, who devoted themselves to God in a fresh way. And so I invite you to read this passage with me out loud as we come back to it this morning, starting in verse 42. Let's read together. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Right? They devoted themselves. Right? This was a conscious, intentional decision to devote themselves to what we see. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, biblical teaching, to God's word. We considered that a couple of weeks ago. Right? They sold property and possessions so they could give to those in need and fund the mission of the local church. We considered that a couple of weeks ago, of being devoted to sacrificial giving. They devoted themselves to fellowship. Bill Moore preached on that last week. Fellowship being friendship with follow-through. Right? So today's focus is being devoted to the breaking of bread. To the breaking of bread. Even today, that phrase, hey, let's break bread together, speaks of sharing a meal with another person or with a group. 
Here we see in this early picture of, of, of the church, of the early Christians, that they broke bread in their homes. And they ate together, he says, with glad and sincere hearts. Right? There's something, that's spe- something special that happens around a meal, whether it's with one other person or in a group. And these early Christians experienced that. No doubt this also pointed to, to the Lord's Supper, or we call it communion. As they got together and remembered, as Jesus gathered his disciples on the night he was betrayed and gave them specific actions, actions to remember him, to thank him, and to celebrate him. As they broke bread, that, the description here in this Acts chapter 2 speaks of them coming together for that sacred meal. So we're going to focus on that sacred meal this morning before we participate in that sacred meal together. What about this Lord's Supper? What about communion? What is the meaning? What's the significance and what's the impact of participating in that together? Right, the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Corinthians, the Christians in Corinth, shared what was passed on to him and then what he passed on to that church and what's been passed on through the centuries in church history to us to the point of even today as we share in communion in the Lord's Supper, those same words are echoed. And we read that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 23, a description of this time of coming together around the sacred meal. We read this, For I received from the Lord what, also, what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. All right, so this is the description of, of the sacred meal, of this Lord's Supper, this time of communion. Words have been echoed through the centuries throughout the church. And so what exactly happens in the midst of this time, this sacred meal? Now, this morning, I don't have time to go through all the details of church history, of the different ideas around what exactly happens mechanically with the bread and the wine or juice. I mean, at some point, I would love to teach a seminar in terms of different ideas about what exactly happens. How does it happen? But today, I want us to focus on the impact and the significance of the experience, the shared experience that we have together in this meal. And for that, a chapter earlier, Paul gives a description of what is the meaning and significance and impact of this meal. And so let me read that to you as well as we continue to consider what exactly happens when we share in communion. Chapter 10, verses 14, Paul writes this, Therefore, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. He says, I speak to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body. For we all share the one loaf. Let's read that verse together, verse 17. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body. For we all share the one loaf. I believe that God supernaturally deepens our connection to him and to one another when we share in communion together. That something supernatural happens. It's not just taking a piece of bread, not just dipping it in juice, not just receiving it, and not even just asking for forgiveness of our sins, but in renewing our relationship with God, though that happens. That something supernaturally happens that deepens our connection to God and to one another through that process. And we see that in this passage. I mean, in the beginning, Paul says, and he, he, he comes with a personal appeal. He says, dear friends, dear friends. And he says, flee from idolatry. Right? An idol, which is anything that competes for our affection, our attention, and devotion to God. He says, flee from it. There's imminent danger. Get away. How does he give direction for how to get away from idols? He points them to this sacred meal, this shared meal, the Lord's Supper. And he appeals to their senses, and he says, you make an assessment. And then in verse 16, he asks mysterious questions. Questions that for years of, of being a Christian, I'm like, what is Paul talking about here? Like, what's he getting at in verse 16 when he says, it's not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation 
in the blood of Christ. And he says, is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? What is he talking about here? Well, the word participation is important. It speaks to mutual sharing. It speaks to a sense of interconnectedness and, and mutuality of a partnership. Right, it's the Greek word that's translated, the Greek word koinonia, which is translated participation here. In other places, it's translated as fellowship. Right, it's a sense of this interweaving, this mutual sharing. I invite you to take your hands and put them together like this. Go ahead. It's, time. it's participatory Sunday. Right, There's a sense of coming together, this interweaving. Right, it's not two separate entities, but it's the entities coming together, being woven together. He's saying something happens supernaturally when we receive the bread we receive from the cup that there's a participation in the body and blood of christ meaning his the participation in the benefits of his sacrificial death that he gave on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins that there's a connection to god a supernatural deeping of that connection to him and to one another it's interesting, in that time period, in Roman meals, many of the meals were dedicated to, to gods or deities. And the assumption was that around those meals, that the food was given during that time period would have been sacrificed to that deity or to that god. And the belief was that if you ate that meal, you would grow closer to that deity and also closer to the ones that were around you. That same approach was given here from Paul, being like, instead of some random Roman god, we're talking about the, the one true god who's revealed in Jesus Christ, who came to be with us, to live the perfect life we couldn't live, who died on a cross for the forgiveness of our sins, and in real time on the third day was resurrected from the dead, overcoming sin and evil and death itself. Here Paul's saying, by participating in this Lord's Supper and communion, there's a supernatural deepening of that connection with God, but then also with one another. Why one another? In verse 17, the verse I had you read, he says, because there's one loaf, we who are many, who are, are one body, for we all share in one loaf. He starts and ends that verse with, with the words one loaf. He's making a point that there's one loaf, there's unity, there's connection. That's where it all comes from. As we receive that bread, it binds us together. It connects us in that meal. I know for me, again, as I shared earlier, that when I share a meal with something, someone, there's a deeper sense of connection with them. Have you had that experience? Whether it's one-on-one or with a group. It's interesting how that happens. You share a meal and, and you share food and conversation. It's a wonderful thing. What's interesting is that researchers have shown if you eat the same food as the other person, there's a higher level of trust and cooperation between those who participate in the meal. There's a, a, a study done at the University of Chicago a couple of years ago. It's fascinating. They got a group of people, and they took one group and said, you eat the same food, and another group, you eat different kinds of food. The one group ate the same kinds of food, and then they put them through different relational scenarios. One scenario was an employer and an employee negotiating how much he or she should be paid. When they ate the same food, they came to an agreement for that pay level two times faster. And when they ate different food, it took them two times as long to negotiate how much that person should be paid. So it's a higher level of cooperation when they actually ate the same exact food. Same study, same group, a different group would eat the same kind of food. And someone would come in and give a sales presentation. And as the person gave the sales presentation, the person giving the sales presentation ate the same food as those hearing the presentation. And they mapped a higher level of trust of those listening to the sales presentation actually moving towards a purchase of that item when they ate the same food. When they ate different food, there was a lower level of trust. Isn't that fascinating? And so it made me think of uh, all the times where I've been eating the same food with another person. Has there been a higher level of trust and cooperation? Well, last week I had the opportunity um, to experience this. I was at my Uncle Alfred's funeral. And we, as like a good Chinese family, there were multiple banquets uh, at, at, the, at that time. And so after the viewing or wake, we went to Park Asia, this um, incredible Chinese restaurant on 66th Street in Brooklyn. And we walked into this big banquet room, and there were round tables. And everyone sat around the table. And what, what did they do? Did everyone come and then order their own specific food? And I'll take a number two, I'll take a number f-. No. They put in one big plate of food in the middle. Right? What you're looking at up there is... Jellyfish and pig. 
and there's something powerful, right? Yeah, you could use chopsticks. About passing the food and sharing from the same plate, right? And eating the same food as my cousin Lisa, my cousin Kathleen, my Aunt Jade, my mom and my dad. Right? As we ate from that common food, I felt a re- sense of reconnection to my cousins, my aunt, my parents. And there's something that was powerful about having the same food at the same time. And then I came upon this study and thought, there's, there's got to be something to that. Now, if that applies to Chinese food and applies to studies from the University of Chicago, how much more does that apply when we share the same bread and juice that points us to Jesus Christ? Right? It's an amazing thing. We get to share in the same meal together. Right? That, and it's not just bread and juice. It points us to the one who gave his life for the forgiveness of our sins so we could be welcomed into a new family, adopted into the new family of Jesus, where all of us come to the sacred family meal as brothers and sisters in Christ. We are family. Amen? Amen. Families don't always get along. Families aren't always unified. But the beautiful thing is that they come together and they eat. And when they eat the same food, it provides a chance for, again, for a supernatural reconnection, deepening of that connection with God and with one another. And so as I thought about this, what does this mean for me? I think about Christ's sacrifice, and what does it mean? A quote from a couple Bible commentators, they say this, Christ's sacrifice of his body and blood for us establishes what we could never achieve otherwise, right? True communion with God and participation in the life he has won for us through the cross. So as we share in the Lord's Supper, as we share in a time of communion, Recognize it's a supernatural, sacred meal where God deepens our connection with him and with one another. Because I know for me, as I think about this, sometimes I've thought about the Lord's Supper or communion as, hey, it's kind of me and Jesus time. Like I need to confess my sins. I need to get the bread and juice and it's me and Jesus. And there's people around me, but it's really me and Jesus. There's an element of that. It's your relationship with God, absolutely. But don't lose, I've had to remember not to lose track of all those around me. And what's happening through that meal? Because I am starved for connection. I'm starved for connection with God. I'm starved, starved for connection with other people. I, like, I'm human. I need it. And the beautiful good news is that Jesus in John 6.35 said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Right? Jesus offers himself. And he's the one who could only satisfy my soul-level cravings and desires. And one way he does that is, is I and we devote ourselves to the breaking of bread. We can reestablish and reconnect with God in a significant way. So what does this mean for you? Same thing. I ask that you now consider that this sacred meal is not just a you and Jesus time. right? Yes, it deepens your connection with God, but also supernaturally deepens your connection with the rest of us in this room who are participating. It's a powerful, powerful opportunity for us to receive from the bread of life. And so how can we devote ourselves in light of this? We need to devote ourselves again to the breaking of bread. And there's two primary ways. One, as we now begin in, in a couple moments to engage in communion, to engage in this as a supernatural meal, supernatural sacred meal. Where God deepens our connection with him and deepens our connection with one another. And don't lose track of Acts 2. It also spoke of broader meals, of that they broke bread in their homes and they ate with each other with glad and sincere hearts. And something happens over a meal. And my prayer is as a church that we would discover or rediscover what it means to invite one another, one another over for a meal, to share in meals together, whether one-on-one or couples or families or just big groups, and to allow that to, for, for stories to be shared. Laurie and I had a wonderful opportunity on Friday night to go out with a couple in our church and simply sit down and share stories about life. Share about the struggles and joys of marriage and parenting and life and faith and just, just trying to get by day to day. I, mean, I woke up Saturday morning being like, that is a wonderful part of life. May that be a part of a marker of who we are. That we would break bread in our homes or even out in restaurants, wherever it is, and eat with glad and sincere hearts and let God weave us together. Right, and that participation, that koinonia, that fellowship that he could bring about. Let's pray. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are good. 
Your grace is enough. And we need your grace. We need your love. We need your renewal. And we need your restoration. God, we're all broken. But God, you're the God who puts us back together. And God, we don't have to do it alone. You promise to never leave us nor forsake us. You promise to walk with us. And you give us the gift of yourself and the gift of one another, brothers and sisters in Christ and this new family of Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. We thank you. We remember you. We celebrate you this morning. Jesus Christ, the resurrected Son of God, we thank you for your grace. You are enough. You are enough. We pray in Jesus' name.